Hello, booze and ghouls, and welcome to Terry's True Paranormal Experiences. I would like, if I may, to take you along on a strange journey. This first one I call The Beast of Barton Road. It was the fall of 1986. I had a friend who had had a birthday and he wanted to go visit his family that lived about 20 miles away in a very small town called Barton. Barton is an old backwater mining town with a population of about 450 people. As with many old mining towns, it seemed the cold permeated the air and covered everything with a dreary, dirty layer that settled into the pores of every home and business. I didn't want to go because my car was still broken down, but he didn't want to make the trip alone, so finally I gave in. We ended up taking the bus into downtown, for lack of a better word, to Barton, which was beside a railroad track, and we met his mom, who drove us back to his old home. The family was nice, but kind of strange. The arrangements were that his father would drive us back to Cumberland. We stayed several hours, and I kept looking at the clock, waiting to leave. But the time went on, and the evening was turning into night. Everyone was starting to go to bed, except for the father, who was a rather old, gruff man. When my friend asked his father to take us home finally, the father replied that he wasn't driving after dark. I was very stubborn in those days, and determined to get home that night. So I told my friend politely that I needed to get home and I'd just walk. I really wanted to get home and away from this strange family, even if it killed me. My friend said he'd come along too because he wanted to get home also. So we set off toward the interstate highway that would take us back to Cumberland and maybe where we could hitchhike the other way back home. Barton has few street lights, and there were none on the stretch of road to get to the interstate. Fortunately, the moon was full that night and acted as a very dim nightlight in the darkness. The road was built on a flat clearing with rows of corn that had long been dead and broken to the ground by countless winds and rains on each side of the road. The only obstruction from the fields of corn was a strip of land with mounds of dirt that ran along the road like small waves where the road had cut through a series of small mounds. We were only about a quarter of the way along the trip when I heard a growl. I asked my friend if he had heard what I heard. His eyes were wide open and he frantically shook his head. I didn't hear that, he said growled again. Without saying a word, I turned and looked at my friend who looked at me wide-eyed again and said, I didn't hear that either. We stopped and looked around us, but no one could hear or see anything moving. We started walking faster. As I walked, I looked around me, but no signs of movement of a dog or anything. When the growl broke to silence again, we picked up pace even more. We knew better than to run, should it be a dog or wild animal. The sounds were originating to our right, somewhere around the fields, or median beside the road. Yet, neither of us saw anything. Suddenly, a patch of clouds started to darken the face of the moon. As our sole source of light faded, panic gripped my heart. Ahead was a bend in the road, and I hoped that right around the corner might be a stray farmhouse or perhaps some place with some light, any light. We rounded the bend, and I had a fear of a wild animal jumping on me from behind, tearing me apart. The deep growl happened again, but fortunately I could still hear it like it was a distance away. Still, in a few quick bounds, it could be on us at any time. My imagination started going wild and even briefly played a thought that this could be a werewolf. <laughs> yes, I said a werewolf. It was only a passing thought, yet in the darkness, fear can bring some wild things to mind. Suddenly there in the straightaway ahead of us, in the middle of the road was a street light. We had almost reached the interstate. Still, the ground followed along the side as it continued until we reached the safety of the street lamp. There it stopped. Still from that lighting, we saw nothing around us. Was it an animal that managed to evade our sights? 
or was it something more in the middle of the night? Was it something in the paranormal or something in the unknown? I'll never know. We never caught a ride that night and it was nearly dawn before we got back to town. And I've never, ever been back to that stretch of road since. I'll tell you a little bit about the town of Frostburg. While I attended Frostburg State College, now it's a university, I lived in Frostburg, Maryland, appropriately named because it sits about 15 miles outside of Cumberland up into the Appalachian Mountains. Weather takes an abrupt change ascending into the mountains west of Cumberland. While it'd be nice and sunny at the foot of the Appalachians, Frostburg, in the summer months, is frequently shrouded in dense fog and a chill in a damp air that will freeze you to the bone. Winters are even worse. It would get so cold that walking from campus building to campus building, the cold would make my eyes water and the tears would freeze in layers over my glasses. Consequently, when the last days of summer were fading, Frostburg would be the first town in the county to start the autumn frosts. I lived in a grand old house on Main Street, which sat along the main road from Cumberland to Morgantown, West Virginia. My apartment was on the first floor of the house, which was clearly once owned by a wealthier citizen of the town. And my apartment was one of two or three that the house had eventually been divided into. Being spacious and open, the apartment was usually a hangout for friends who lived in cramped dorm rooms. It was in my apartment there that I had my first clear view of a spirit. Several mornings when I woke up early as the sun was rising, I would go to the kitchen and see an African-American woman standing, looking out the window into the foggy mists of the backyard. She wore a blue dress in the style of the 1800s with a big white scarf around her neck. Her features were very clear, yet she was semi-transparent. I would stand very still as not to disturb her and just watch. I wasn't scared at all. In fact, my heart went out to her. Something told me she had been a slave at some point. The look on her face was like a yearning or maybe a sadness. It was like she was looking for someone to come walking out of the mist in the backyard. That person would never show up. And after several moments, she too would just fade away. I had another experience as well. In Frostburg, there wasn't much for college students to do when we weren't studying. The town is relatively small, other than the student population. During our summertime, the town seemed to go dormant as businesses all but closed down for the season while classes are out. Regardless, year-round, we were given two options. Either go to one of the numerous local bars or hang out with your friends and figure out what to do for entertainment. Entertainment which often involved doing something stupid. And while I was too young for the bars, which didn't always stop me anyway, I would often do things with friends to ease the boredom. One evening in the apartment next to mine, a bunch of us decided to do a seance to contact the recently departed grandmother of one of the girls in our group. A candle was lit and we all sat in a circle around it with the lights out. One of us was the leader of the seance who told us to hold the hands of the other people beside us and close our eyes while we concentrated on the girl's grandmother. The seance leader then called forth the spirit of the girl's grandmother and nothing happened. We sat briefly in silence, waiting. As we sat there, eyes closed, awaiting a sign, suddenly a warm, calming feeling came over me. I could smell the scent of Old Spice cologne, and I instantly knew this was my grandfather. My grandfather, who had passed away about ten years prior. I said nothing about it until everyone asked me what had happened. They said I had suddenly had a real peaceful, relaxed look about me, 
and they really saw a change come over my appearance. I knew then that my grandfather was watching over me. It was an amazing and very comforting experience. This next tale takes place when I lived in the house by Rose Hill Cemetery. When I was first living on my own, I had an apartment, which I'll tell you about in a future story. And although the rent was reasonable, I kept several jobs just to make ends meet. I seldom slept. One day I was talking with some friends who were looking for apartments, and we all decided it would be cheaper to rent a house and split the rent between the five of us. We found an old house that was once owned by some of the wealthier citizens. It was in an old neighborhood that was now taken over by middle-class dwellers, mostly aging couples. There were very few children in the area. When we got to the place, it was a four-bedroom home with a spacious attic that we were turning into a fifth bedroom. The three-story house was built around a central stairwell that ran all the way from the basement to the attic. The house was dirty for many years of abandonment and in need of cleaning before we could move in, so it was decided that the others would go to the store to pick up some cleaning supplies while I was left alone to try to do what I could do without the supplies. After they had left, I looked around and tried to figure out where to start. I happened to be in the attic when I heard the cries of a small boy saying, Help me, Mommy. I've fallen. I was surprised to hear the child's voice in the house, or even the neighborhood for that matter. I continued to hear the boy's cry. I'm hurt, Mommy. Help me. I went down to the second floor and looked in all the rooms. Nothing. This was true of the first floor as well. I walked outside and found it was quiet outside, no children around. It was during school hours, so the handful of children in the neighborhood were in school. I walked back inside and came to discover that the cries only came from the area of the stairwell. I went to the top of the basement stairs and tried to peer into the darkness below. The stairwell was lined with the remains of red candles with a strange-looking chunk of fleshy-feeling substance. I had no clue what it was, but it was creepy enough to prevent me from going down the stairs. I heard the pitiful cry again. It was coming from upstairs and downstairs at the same time. I decided to try upstairs again and leave the basement alone for a while. I continued looking fruitlessly in the house until the cry slowly faded, and I was completely perplexed by where the boy could have been. I was positive by the point that I was completely alone in the house. My friends arrived back shortly after, and I went outside to help carry the supplies in. I told one friend about the strange cries. The response I got sent chills down my spine. They told me how odd that was, because as they was pulling up in the car, another friend pointed up to the attic window and asked, who the little boy was standing there. Recently I've read that a boy in the neighborhood had actually died by falling downstairs and is now said to haunt the area. Hmm. This next experience I call the Ghost of Grand Avenue. Out of college, my first apartment was in a duplex in Cumberland's old historic South Side on a street that was so old it was still paved in the original brick from a century ago. I lived on the second floor of one side, which also had access to an attic, which I never used. The apartment was a long string of rooms running from the bedroom in front, facing the street, to a living room and then the kitchen in the rear. If I left my doors open, I could lie in bed and see all the way into the kitchen. It was a quiet house with elderly people living in the other three apartments. Lucky me, I lived above an old lady who was a busybody. Watching out her window every time I came and went and pounding on her ceiling every time I walked across the wooden floor in my shoes. I didn't have a TV, but even my radio playing was enough to send her rapping on the ceiling with the broomstick. It was a less than perfect living arrangement, but it was 
what I could afford at the time. I was only in this apartment about a week before I was awakened one night around 2 a.m. by the sound of heavy footsteps. I paid little attention to the noise and went back to sleep. The following night, I was again disturbed from my sleep by the footsteps at the same time as the previous night. This time I noticed the sound was coming from the attic above me. No one else had access to this attic, which could only be reached by a door in my bathroom. Oddly, the footsteps always seemed to end when it reached the spot above my bed. The next night I was having trouble falling asleep. It was nearly 2 a.m. when in the dark I heard the footsteps again. They started at the far end of my apartment above the kitchen and walked slowly until once again it stopped above my bed. I was nervous but curious and decided to go look in the attic to find the source. I turned on the light and climbed the stairs far enough to give me a full view of the space. There was nothing or no one. I closed and barricaded the door that night before going back to bed, and I had trouble sleeping that night. It continued on the same every night. One night the footsteps woke me as it had been doing for several weeks. I got up and went to the kitchen for something to eat. Somehow I bumped a garbage can and out ran four gigantic cockroaches. They were the size of the palm of my hand, which really freaked me out. I'd never had cockroaches, but I'd seen them before, and these were monstrous compared to those. Between the huge roaches and the annoying neighbor below me, and the nightly visits from the spirit, I had reached my limit. I found out some of my friends were planning on finding a house together, and I begged them to be included. That story I've already told you about in the house by the cemetery. After moving out, I was telling a friend about my experiences in the apartment. They got wide-eyed and said, Whoa, you lived in that apartment? I lived there myself and saw things moving on their own. She continued, I was taking a picture and a guitar I had on my sofa flipped over and landed upright on the opposite side of the sofa. I had to get out of there. As fantastical as that sounded, I had no doubts that her story was true. This next one I call The Lurker of Rose Hill Cemetery. In Cumberland, Maryland, where I grew up, there are a number of old cemeteries, but none so tightly crammed full of monuments, tombs, headstones, and mausoleums as Rose Hill Cemetery. By day, it can be foreboding. In the fading hours of dusk, I would discover it can be terrifying. I lived in an old house in a quiet neighborhood half a block from Rose Hill Cemetery. When my car broke down, I had to walk to work while saving to get it fixed. The route I took to and from work both went by Rose Hill and another less cluttered cemetery. As I was walking home one evening, the sun had already set and the night was quickly approaching. The street lights had just come on, further illuminating the surroundings. I had already passed the first cemetery and had reached the wrought iron fence surrounding Rose Hill. The street was barren of any pedestrians or residents. In fact, being a Sunday, there were very few cars parked on the road. The only sounds were coming from the crickets and a lone dog barking. As I walked along the sidewalk, I wasn't thinking of the cemetery that lay just feet away from me. I was more concerned with getting home and resting after my shift and that long walk. Suddenly, the stillness of the night was broken by a shadow slipping silently along the hillside of the cemetery, about 30 feet up the hill from me. From the corner of my eye, I caught the movement, which abruptly ended behind a tall monument. The activity was very unexpected, as the cemetery gates were closed at dusk, and people weren't paying their respects at that hour. I paused and looked at the spot where the shadow had disappeared. I thought I had seen some movement behind the tall, narrow stone, but when nothing else happened, I continued on, glancing frequently in that area. During one of my glances, 
looked, I caught the shadow movement again as it faded behind the cover of a large tree. I knew I was being watched and followed. I picked up my pace, my eyes not leaving the trunk of the old tree. The next thing I knew, a black shadow in human form ran and crouched behind a large headstone. The figure had no discernible features or collars. It was just transparent black. A fear began to grow as I realized this was not a human being. Just a black shadow. My own shadow paled in comparison to the dark figure. To make matters worse, we were both headed in the same direction, toward the intersection in front of me and the cemetery entrance. I was walking briskly at this point, staring at the shadow that was moving in fluid motion, racing from the cover of a small family tomb and darting behind a monument. All the while, I grew closer and closer to the cemetery gates. Finally, the adrenaline kicked in and I took off running. When I glanced over, I saw that the entity was no longer hiding behind anything, but had taken off in a full sprint, racing toward the gates and the intersection and me. Although I knew the gates were closed and locked, something told me that the bars on the gates would not contain it. I ran as fast as my legs would carry me across the empty intersection and took one last glance back. Through the bars of the cemetery fencing, I could see it had nearly reached the gates and it was not slowing down. I continued down the block away from the cemetery and then doubled back to get home. I didn't stop running until I got to my front door, expecting that thing to be on my heels. I was inside the house and had the door bolted shut in seconds. That night, I had nightmares that the thing knew where I lived and was coming for me. I stopped working that shift after that, and I never passed by that cemetery again on foot when the light of day was fading. This creepy true tale I call Lucy's House. One of my last apartments in Cumberland, Maryland, was in an old Victorian-styled house on Decatur Street. It was a two-bedroom apartment that I got along with a friend. We had had the second floor of the house along with access to the upper unremodeled part of the house that we decided to clean up and use also. The house must have been built before electricity was introduced because the wall showed telltale markings where the gas lighting used to hang in days gone by. The upper floor was dark with only one single hanging light bulb that lit the hall, stairwell, and any of the three rooms there if the doors were left open. There were two small ancient bedrooms and a third unfinished room for storage. The area was not only dimly lit, but also the ancient faded tattered wallpaper looked like it had been there since the house was built over a century ago. It was once probably the servants' quarters. We decided our best bet was the paint to lighten it up to make it livable. Since we both worked day shifts, the evenings were mainly the only time we had to work on it. Our first evening of painting started out smoothly. I started on the upstairs hall while my roommate started on the stairwell. We talked and joked as we painted, trying to ignore the stale smell of the abandoned area. All three doors were closed upstairs, but there was an eerie feeling in that area that I just attributed to the dimness and echo of our voices when we talked in the empty space. Suddenly the door to the storage space creeped open slowly. We both froze and watched it go. I thought that maybe it hadn't been closed properly, so I walked over to close it again. The door quickly slammed shut in my face. This unnerved me so much I decided to stop what I was doing, clean up my paint and tools, and return to our main floor. That night the paranormal activity started on our main floor. Things would fly off the walls and shelves, accompanied by bangs and ghostly footsteps. Also that night, a kitten that I had just gotten the day before died unexpectedly. The following evening, I was still grieving over the loss and decided to wrap myself up into doing some more painting. That evening, we, we decided to bring along a radio to help cheer up the dismal atmosphere of the upstairs. 
All went well for a time, and I was starting to overcome my apprehension of the space when the sole light, light bulb began to flicker. The light switch at the bottom of the stairs clicked, and we were almost in complete darkness aside from what little light managed to filter up the stairs. Then, just as my friend Chris turned the light switch back on, the open door I heard opening suddenly slammed shut. I raced through the stairs, leaving the paint cans open and brushes still covered in paint. I decided to get another kitten the next day, and that evening, feeling happy and unfazed by the previous night's happenings, I set to work on painting the upstairs again. That night, all hell would break loose. It wasn't long before the doors started creaking open and slamming shut, the light flickering. At the same time, the door at the foot of the steps also slammed shut. Afraid of being stuck up there with whatever that was, I quickly retreated and decided to put painting on that story of the house on the back burner. The next day, the kitten stopped eating and became very ill. I took it to the vet, but it died the following night. My friend encountered one of the older local neighbors and told him of some of the experiences. The man said that the former owner of the house was a very nasty old woman named Lucy. I decided to try getting one more kitten. That one I named Lucy, and would you believe it survived? From that point on, the apartment became easier to live in. The events in the apartment became less frequent, and when they did happen, we would just say, Sorry to bother you, Lucy, and it would stop. Although the top floor was never worked on again, and we moved out as soon as it became possible, from that point on I became less afraid of the unknown. This next experience I had, I call the return of Uncle Shuen. Once, about 30 years ago, I visited a friend who lived in a very old farmhouse on a country road just several miles outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. I was with a group of other friends of Joe, the owner, that day. He was having a small party and had invited about six people. By chance, most of us arrived within minutes of each other. Joe was waiting outside in the chilled autumn air to greet us. The outside of the house had a layer of dirt and grime, not outside the ordinary for an old house that sits along a road well-traveled by cold trucks. The style was definitely that of another era, and the huge trees that partly hid the house from the main road gave further indications of the farmhouse's age. All but one or two of us had never seen Joe's place before, so he gave us a tour of the aged structure. When we came through the front door, we were in a small foyer that led off in different directions of the house. An old yellowed light bulb in a dusty chandelier overhead further aged the area with an amber hue. Heavy curtains were drawn to keep in the heat, but also served, unintentionally, to keep out the cheerfulness of the afternoon sun. Items from generations of families that had resided there previously still lingered throughout the house, from the antique furniture to the other items that hung on the wall and sat in darkened corners of the house. To be honest, there were few items of Joe's to be seen. It was as if the home had been permanently lost in the past, and he was just a temporary modern custodian. Joe was a simple man who appreciated the craftsmanship of the bygone eras. He was also a chimney sweep, which was demonstrated by the dirty black suit and top hat he wore for his job, which lay on an old chair by the wood-burning stove, further displaying his quirky nature. He loved the house and was a perfect occupant for it. For some reason, when we walked into the foyer that day, my eyes were immediately drawn to movement at the balcony on the top of the stairs on the second floor landing. An old man, who seemed completely oblivious to our presence, walked across the landing and into a room to the left. 
He was slightly hunched over by age and gripped the railing tightly, but still managed to keep a good pace. Although the landing was dark, made even worse by the darkened house after my eyes had been adjusted to the bright sun outside. I couldn't make out the room he entered as part of the house was still even darker. As we were passing by the stairs, I asked Albert in a low voice if he had seen the old man. He hadn't. I'd soon find out that none of the other guests that night had seen the old man either. As soon as we walked into the adjoining dining room, I asked my friend Joe, in a hushed voice, to be polite in case the elderly man was listening from the top of the stairs, who the man was. Joe, as I had understood it, lived alone. I described the old man to Joe, whose jaw hung open and the blood seemed to drain from his face. He asked, Do you mean Uncle Shuin? He took me to an old portrait of a man that hung in another room, occupied by an ancient piano, to get my reaction. It was him. Through painted eyes, the face of the old man I had just seen on the second floor landing now stared back at me. The clothing was different, but that was the same man. Joe had said that he had had a number of experiences that he attributed to his uncle who had passed away long ago, but never seen his spirit. I later discovered in the tour room the man had entered was once a bedroom of Uncle Shuin. Now it was Joe's bedroom. No wonder he looked pale. Apparently the former occupants of the house were still hanging around, watching over the farmhouse. Funny thing I noticed about that room, the door was closed when we saw it. The specter of Uncle Shuin that I had seen hadn't paused a bit at the doorway to open it. I suddenly realized he had walked right through the solid door. I don't know if it was the knowledge that I had just seen a spirit up there, but the entire tour of the second floor, I felt like we were being watched. Sadly, Joe has since passed away, but I can't help but wonder if he too now roams the hall of that old farmhouse along with his uncle. Well, thank you for joining me on this true tale. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>